Sunday, February 21st, 2021. I had to think about that. My name is Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast, of Disturbing on the Lake, episode number uh, uh, 591. And we have uh, one of our favorite guests uh, with us, Ed, Edward Angelini Cook. Ed. Yay! I also have a new camera angle. So Do you? That's, that's me, yeah. Right. I mean, and you guys can't see it because I'm using a different one. But, you know. Uh, I was trying something out. I mean, uh, let me know what you guys think. Would you prefer the, the, the writing for the computer or what have you instead of me kind of like constantly looking away in one direction or another? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Anyways. We'll see. Anyways, Gary, uh, why do we have uh, uh, our resident sex therapist with us? Well, because actually it's a let's talk about sex episode. Oh. Aha. Uh -huh. And cue the music cue. Oh, uh, th that's right. <laughs> I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like sitting here going. Honestly, I've only had about four hours of sleep, so. Hmm. Oh. So you're dysfunctional is what I'm hearing. Yes. Okay. Speaking of dysfunction. <laughs> or not. Or maybe. Wait, wait. I... <laughs> what? <laughs> well, let's talk about what some that. people might they think is a dysfunction. Them. Yeah. See? But I, I know what I'm talking about. Y'all might not, but I do. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, Ed, you're back with us again because uh, we wanted to talk about something that folks may have um that they might need some clarity on we'll put it that way um you and i had recently discussed about how um people construe that intimacy should have one specific end result mm -hmm. and that is not always the case so i think that's kind of how we came about with this idea of orgasms versus ejaculation yes um yeah, I'm really excited to talk about this, uh, and I'm really glad that we're kind of talking about this. Um, so, uh, I mean, like you kind of saw in the in the the Google Doc, um, I have a lot of like I have a lot of notes on this, and it's very biocentric or bio and neuro neurocentric. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't want this to feel like a um, like a lecture or anything, but um, so if there are questions that, that that either of you have, please let me know. Um, but, you know, the things that I do want to just kind of talk about are the fact, like, what Gary was talking about, that um, uh, with, like, the, the, the experiences of ejaculation and orgasm, that they're two separate things. Uh, typically, they are experienced at the same time, but they don't, but, like, there are two physiological responses happening. Um, and it's important that we know that and that, um, so like, you know, you will hear that, um, it's not an orgasm, um, or somebody doesn't have to have an erection in order to ejaculate and, uh, somebody doesn't need to ejaculate in order to orgasm. Um, and then, you know, another final takeaway, you know, at the end of this is I want people to real, to, to understand that a positive sexual experience does not have to include um, either an orgasm or an ejaculation in order for it to be positive. Um, so those are kind of the, the things. So if, if any of you have any uh, questions about, um, you know, how that could come up, lay it out there. But um, what I think is really uh, interesting is as far as like, so like what's kind of happening in our body during both uh, ejaculation and orgasm. Um, so specifically with ejaculation, um, and actually, so I think before we talk about this, we have to talk about the sexual response cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So like, w by that I mean like, that's the research that Masters and Johnson um, and um, 
and Kaplan did, um, where they, uh, you know, uh, so Masters of Jarjan first came up with the four stage um, cycle being excitement, plateau, orgasm, and uh, satisfaction. And then Kaplan came up with his research that added desire to it, because that's an important part of it. But these all kind of play into it because our body, right, responds at different levels. And um, because of that process, we're able to get to different stages um, at various different levels. So like uh, when we're first, uh, like uh, when we're first kind of, you know, desiring sex, right, we can go into like this relaxation stage. And that is what stimulates the erection. Um, you know, that's a uh, kind of um, an inner change between our brain, which is sending signals down to through our nervous system to our vascular system. And that leads to the penage, uh, penile rigidity. Um, and like I said, so that's controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and the way that I remember that is, so parath parasympathetic, um, I think with the P for point. <laughs> um, so, you know, let's, let's skip um, a little bit. So like, as far as ejaculation goes, so that's two different processes happening at the same time. So we have emission, so that is um, that is the the part where um, our uh, you know we're preparing for ejaculation. That's where all of the fluids that make up semen, right? This the um, the the sperm and the um, the other seminal fluids are um, are mixing and they're merging and they're uh, you know finding their way to the uh, to the prostate. Um, or what word do we learn? The ver the <laughs> <laughs> verimentatum <laughs> verimentatum or Very also the balloon um so that's located within the prostate gland right so like um and we can definitely talk about this but like when somebody gets like very stimulated um to the point of ejaculation that balloon fills up three times to its size and once it reaches reaches critical mass um it will trigger this thing called the ejaculation um inevitability response and i love this so when that happens um there is nothing that is going to stop you from from ejaculating right um so like somebody could could walk into wherever you are shooting guns a blazing but you're still shooting that load my friend very interesting concept because i don't think most people realize that we've always been known or thought that um you can stop yourself you can hold off you can you can delay the response but there is i think a point where as you're saying that that's not going to happen like you can try but it's not going to happen you're going to ejaculate like it you're going to come like whether you want to or not it's going to happen and no matter what is happening it's going to happen because it's a bodily function essentially Mm -hmm. right. And um, so like uh, if anybody has seen Bridgerton, there is a, a highly uh, critical scene where um, one of the characters gets, I mean, basically sexually assaulted. And, um, you know, it's not really uh, and uh, is a male. Right. And, um, you know, the, the criticism about that is there is ejaculatory inevitability. Right. Like he can't control that. Um, so mm -hmm. like, you know, just because he's ejaculating doesn't mean that he wanted it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was that was going to happen. Um, and the, you know, like what you were kind of talking about. So a lot of like when I'm working with people who have premature ejaculation, we're not working on ejaculatory control. We're working on emission control because mm -hmm. that is where all of the our control happens is with the, um, uh, you know, that part. Right. Because once we reach um, the ejaculatory stage, there's no turning back. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting way to think about it. There's a, like you said, there's a point where it happens. Like there, there, there's no turning back. You're, you're, you know, you're full. It's coming out. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, like something's going to happen. And, but before that, we have that, for lack of a better phrase, potential to control that. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that we kind of talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, because that is the 
when the parasympathetic nervous system um, turns into the sympathetic nervous system, which is kind of activating during that stage, but like we still are in that little mix um, mm -hmm. of the two. Um, when we reach like full uh, sympathetic nervous system, um, we are, uh, you know, that's definitely the point of no return. And that's like the other way that I remember that um, sympathetic nervous system equals shoot. So S mm. shoot, parasympathetic point, uh, point and shoot. Ha. Um, uh, like a camera. Uh. Like a camera, right, exactly. Um, so, so like when I'm working with people who are trying to delay their ejaculation, I teach them about some relaxation um, techniques, specifically around their pelvic floor uh, muscles, um, because those are the muscles that they can check in with while they're having sex to let them know um, that like, hey, these muscles are really tense. I need them to be relaxed when we're having sex and when we're in the arousal and the plateau stage of um, of sex, because if they're not, you're more likely to reach the that point of no return. Hmm. Very cool. Sorry. So one of the yeah. things I'm thinking about is how when we were much younger, um, nocturnal emissions was a thing. At least I remember like it kind of having like this, you know, recess playground locker room <clears throat> kind of like <laughs> when you were just becoming uh, hormonal um, going through puberty. It was a it was kind of a discussion point. Um, and how as you kind of got older, like into college age, I'll say, you know, into the end of the 20 end of the teens, into the 20s, how some guys would kind of talk a little bit about um you know, waking up with a wet spot or having a nocturnal emission or, or whatever. And how some guys would be like, I've never had one. And other guys would be like, what? Like they would be kind of confused on both sides of it. And I'm like, well, I think, you know, when that happens, what you're talking about, Ed, is, you know, that um, the body is going to go through cycles, whether you kind of want to or plan to <laughs> or mm -hmm. not. And that's part of what that process was. Um, you know, that that was happening. It just is while you were sleeping, presumably, um, in the middle of the night. So, uh, I think that, yes, there's a distinction. Um, the insight is really <laughs> intriguing to me. Um, like David, I think you were saying, you know, that there comes a point of no return, like that you have no control over what's happening in that moment because it okay. is very much just the body's physical Mm -hmm. um response of, of what's taking place and since i haven't seen bridgerton and you're making that mention ed it really brought to mind about how um people would confuse ejaculation with pleasure mm -hmm. like there's a presumption that because someone ejaculates they're enjoying what's happening in that moment when in fact they may not have control over that yeah uh, have you? I don't remember the name of the movie, but it's a movie with Hugh Jackman, um, and kind of the same thing happens with him. That like, um, uh, like he has to break a code before he ejaculates. So like he has a uh, a woman uh, provide him oral pleasure, and um, the goal is if he if he comes before um, he cracks the the computer code, that the guy will kill him. Mm. Wow. I definitely do not know what you're talking about and I'm highly <laughs> intrigued. I think it's <laughs> I think it's called Swordfish. I think that's the name of the movie. It was it's it, it's in the 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 right Swordfish? I think it's in the right beginning the of the John movie. Travolta I, film? Yeah, I think so. Give me a let second. Me, let me look it up really quickly. IMDb. I don't remember seeing anything about Hugh Jackman in the Swordfish. Password and so like swordfish. To the audience, yep. I apologize for the for the sidebar oh, yeah. to He's... learn about to learn about Hugh Jackman getting heads during a movie. <laughs> yeah, so that's that that would be another good example of like the ejaculatory inevitability that like you know um, that is a that is sometimes a response that we don't have any control over whether we like it or not, right? Because mm -hmm. like. Like even with um, like when I'm working with people who have erectile dysfunction disorders, you know, I'm like the penis responds to touch um, and, uh, you know, 
as we get older, um, our sexual uh, like response cycle changes, right? So like, you know, we, we don't have the same responses that we did when we were like 18. So like sometimes, um, you know, as uh, like as we age, right? Age isn't really a factor. It's just um, it's just that the 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 cycle changes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that um, you know the the thing like when that happens, right? Uh, the sometimes the only way that the penis will um, achieve rigidity is through direct stimulation, right? Mm-hmm. So like, and again, that's not something that we have we have control over because the penis is going to do what the penis is going to do. Um, I often tell people that, um, you know, a lot of times with like erectile dysfunction that, um, when you put a spotlight on the penis, sometimes it's stage fright and it doesn't want to come out. So when it feels like all the attention is on it, it's leaving, it's out Mm -hmm. stage Mm -hmm. right. Um, (laughs) That's it. That's it. Stage right. Stage right. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, you know, we place a lot of anxiety on the performance of our penis and um and and that is a that is a really big issue that being said um like i said before we don't necessarily have to have an erection in order to um in order to orgasm or ejaculate correct speaking from experience like yeah it happens you don't have to you don't have to be like super fucking hard i mean and and knowing some of the external ways that you can stimulate yourself and cause of orgasm without even, you know, touching your penis. It it's it's a thing. Like it does happen. Um, there are ways and means to do things that will potentially cause um, orgasm and our ejaculation. Well, I mean, like we were talking about the the prostate, right? So like that um, that balloon, the verum tatum. I'm getting really good at saying that word. Is located within the within the prostate gland, and that's where all of the um, that's where all the 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 semen and the uh, the seminal fluids that's where all they that's where they converge, right? And they mm-hmm. expand to like three three um, three times the size. So like you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of times, I will suggest a lot of uh, pr- prostate massages, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because that is direct stimulation, mm-hmm. um, and that would be a really good way. And that's also a way that men can experience multiple orgasms um, mm-hmm. through uh, through that because you reach a point of like you're not ejaculating, but you're experiencing a hell of a lot of pleasure. Very well, true. Brings up an interesting point, Ed. Like, do we know what the definition of multiple orgasms is? So, we, if an, we, so if an orgasm isn't an ejaculation. So that's really interesting. So um, orgasm is a um, uh, psychological phenomenon that, like, they're still doing a lot of research on. And um, and I, this is a really good segue into this. Um, but uh, a lot of times with the research, they will do fMRI um, research, which is like brain mapping on the brain uh, when somebody is orgasmed to see what parts of the brain are lighting up. Um, and a lot of times that research is done with women, um, or the, some of the, the research that I was looking at, um, for that, but there's still a lot of information that, um, that is to be learned about, uh, the experience of orgasm from like a neurological standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, there are some like things that, uh, that we do know. So like, uh, so Gary, before, before we were starting the podcast, you were talking about like sexual decision-making. Um, and, uh, and what I like to counter with that is that when we are having sex, like in the process of that, the logical part of our brain, the lateral or, uh, orbitofrontal cortex shuts down. So that's the part of our brain that is responsible for reason, decision-making and value judgments. And that's also likely why we might not be always making the best choices when we're having sex, because we're less likely to, we are less likely to experience fear and anxiety so we see a, a decrease in fear and anxiety. So that's why we're we can be a little bit more um, exhibitionist when we're in when we are in the bedroom. Mm. Also, um, for our kingsters out there, um, the uh, I think it's the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland goes offline. So when the pituitary gland goes offline, our experience of um, pain, our pain tolerance goes higher right 
So like, um, so that is why things that may not feel pleasurable outside of the bedroom or outside of sexual activity feels pleasurable inside the, uh, the sexual activity, because those processes are also happening. Hmm. Um, also when women are given birth, direct clinical, direct clin clitoral stimulation is also um reported to have an um analgesic response meaning that like it will sometimes take the pain away because it is um triggering those parts of the brain as well fascinating right yeah a lot of things happening so uh i'm down here <laughs> I, I I want to talk to you about something post show, Jed. Anyways, <laughs> um, it, it's more kind of a personal thing. Like, anyways, I'll explain later. <laughs> For those that tune in, um, so if orgasm is considered a subjective experience, right, um, likely happening mostly between the ears, right? Then how do we define the multiple orgasm then is it just that like it's a cascade of sensations or like um is it potentially like an overlay of different emotions of different feelings um is it potentially like and i don't want to i don't know how else to phrase this is really inaccurate like we're short circuiting because we're overwhelmed like you know does any of that Makes sense. Do we not have an answer yet? Like, um, well, I think it's different for for men than it is for uh, it's different for women than it is for men when it comes to multiple orgasms. I mean, that makes sense. Um, the one thing that we didn't talk about when we talked about uh, ejaculation and um, well, ejaculation basically is that um, after um, after a man orgasms and ejaculates, right? There is this period called the refractory period which is um, the point in time which he cannot uh, ejaculate again. So um, we, we know that as we age, this is a point where age does come into factor. Um, that gets longer and longer as we get older, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, so uh, you know, for men our age, right, um, it would be typically like, um, like sometimes a day, right? Or like decreased of a day, right? That we um, can see, you know, it's okay for us to, to come again. Um, but I also know there's a lot of people who can, who can uh, orgasm multiple times a day. Um, that being said, the more times that we, um, the more times that we, that we uh, ejaculate, um, the less uh, semen is going to be, no, the less sperm are going to be in the, the semen. Um, and the, uh, the, the lower our, um, product is going mm -hmm. to be, the smaller our product is going to be. Um, so that being said, um, multiple orgasms are rather rare when they happen for men. That doesn't mean that they can't happen, but because of that refractory period, we're not going to see that many, um, of them, uh, because of that, um, and because orgasm is a subjective experience, um, you can through different like relaxation exercises or different uh, like tantric exercises, right? You can reach a state of euphoria, um, which can mirror uh, an orgasm. Um, it's not like, you know, the orgasm that is associated with the, with uh, ejaculation, but it is a height, heightened state of awareness. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, so like, um, like, let's talk about some hormones. So like when we're having sex, there are a few hormones that are released, um, that are happening that are kind of, uh, increasing our state of our affect, right? So we have oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, so those are kind of the cuddle hormones that I like to call them. Um, uh, oxytocin is also the hormone that women, um, uh, excrete um, during labor in order to um, facilitate uh, the dilating process. Um, and uh, so while so while we're you know in the um, arousal and the plateau stage, those cuddle hormones are building up and they are released out of the hypothalamus 
at the point of orgasm with a rush of dopamine. And we know that dopamine is the feel good hormone, right? Like that's the pleasure hormone. So like when we are, um, when we are, uh, even like when we're doing cocaine, right? Um, the do dopamine is the, uh, is the hormone that is released during that. So like a lot of times, um, the experience of an orgasm can mirror the sensation of uh, using drugs. Um, and also uh, that same is happening when we're gambling, right? And also it's not necessarily the, the win that is the feel good. It's the, um, it's the like, <laughs> I'm going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I would wait with a like a slot machine. It's like with every pull of the arm or every push of the button. That's where the dopamine hit. Um, with every yank. With every uh, yank. Right? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> well, so and, and but the dopamine means is something that that comes anytime you you are receiving some sort of pleasurable experience, like the first time you saw the. The entire uh, the in, in Avengers Endgame when the magic portals were opening and basically the entire uh, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe characters came uh, coming out and were displaying everything and you're like whoa you get a dopamine hit because you're getting some sort of pleasure exactly so um. So we know that like, as we rev up closer to orgasm, that uh, this mix of um, the endorphins, right? So like the endorphins are happening because we're, um, we're triggering that sympathetic nervous system. Um, and also the oxytocin and the vasopressin help us to feel less sensitive to pain during sex. Um, you know, like I said before. Um, so the same areas um, in our brain that also that pleasure, that process pleasure are also processing pain there as well which is very fascinating. Um, and then after we orgasm, the body will compensate by this by releasing serotonin, which is the happy hormone, which can also stimulate um, the sense to take a nap, right? So that's why like a lot of people, you know, and like, oh, we're just gonna roll over. Um, so yeah, so, <laughs> Gary? No, I'm, I'm thinking about how uh, stereotypically, women in, in heteronormative per concepts i'll put it this way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. women are annoyed by men because as soon as they come they fall asleep True. like and it's kind of a trope in comedy like if he's uh -huh. on top of her and then you know he has this earth-shattering grunt or whatever and then you know comedically like he just kind of passes out on her or whatever <laughs> um you know and then now she's got a sleeping human body you know for hundreds of pounds or whatever and has to deal with that so i that's what i was amused by you were like you know the happy hormones get released and then you know you just want to take a nap um <laughs> but i think physiologically you know the the differences between um the makeups of our bodies can can you know be a part of that as well as to whether or not you feel that you want to take a nap or not take a nap or you know um and that there's probably ways that you can overcome some aspects of like the way our bodies are but i think that requires like practice and training and and you know certain uh things like it's very intentional and i think that's a a, a distinct difference of you know when you're having sex whether or not you're in like intentionally doing certain activities or trying to think about certain things or, or whatever mm -hmm. i also like i also uh like to tell people that um after sex right is um really important um and that's kind of where a lot of the bonding happenings uh happens so like i i definitely recommend uh you know some like holding um some communication right because that's where a lot of intimacy that's a lot that's where a lot of vulnerability can mm -hmm. come into mix um and mm -hmm. You know, as far as, um, but also that's not the same for everybody, right? Everybody can have different responses during that stage. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to have a conversation, you know, like, hey, like after we finish, right? Like, uh, you know, what, you know, what do you like? Is there anything that you need, right? So like some of that aftercare 
yeah. um, is really important. So, because I mean, sometimes um, I know like women, sometimes they need to run to the bathroom, right? Um, mm-hmm. For their own like self care needs, right? Um, and, you know, so sometimes that can get in the way. And also, why I think it's really important that you kind of communicate that because that could potentially be interpreted as you know running away or some kind of a rejection Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so just kind of normalizing what the um like what i talk to my clients about like the sexual narrative so like what happens um like when we get into what what happens when we start and what happens when we end sex what happens Mm -hmm. in between fair and that makes sense i mean and you know men as well uh, have a tendency to need to go to the bathroom after sex um it's actually from what I had read a long time ago, if I recall correctly, like a a general physiological aspect of after you ejaculate that you go to the bathroom. And part of it is what you were just talking about, Ed, if I can go back to it, um, if I can find it, where, oh, um, how the bladder like is kind of closed mm-hmm. off for a period yeah. of time. So... There's a couple of things that happen. So uh, as one thing, sometimes like guys, uh, you know, folks um, who have penises might wonder why they get an erection when they're like not really being stimulated or having stimulating thoughts. And it could be that the bladder is pushing on the prostate. And so there is some internal stimulation. It's not so much that like, you know, you brushed up against something or you saw something or thought something. Um, <laughs> And that can be an aspect. So once you have ejaculated, then one of the physiological things is to actually evacuate the bladder. And part of that is to clear out, you know, um, through the use of urine, so to speak, from the body. And so, but if you don't know that, like you don't know that that's kind of a normal physiological aspect, then yes, there could be psychological things about like, you know, you want to cuddle, but your partner gets up and just goes to the bathroom. And it's not that they don't want to be with you or they can't. It's actually probably that they're being nice and they're actually going to, you know, what we have deemed in society as an appropriate receptacle. Uh, <laughs> True. <laughs> as True. opposed to, you know, I'm being all over you or the bed or, right. I mean, some people might like that and that's okay. <laughs> like, right. Cause there's no shit, there's no shaming in this. Yeah. No shame in that. But, um, sometimes, again, you know, you want to take a piss. And I, I've had that happen more times than I think. I, I usually can hold off a little bit. But if it's it's weird, actually not weird, not that we're talking about it. But, like, you think about it, I, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I'm remembering, like, okay, I've had moments where I really need to go. But I've also am hard and horny and I get going and I get done, ejaculate orgasm and almost immediately it's like oh you you need to you need to go like you need to you need to pee you need to do it right now or or you're doing it right now like (laughs) wherever you are um and it's interesting i've never thought of it that way how i guess how close they potentially those i was going to say orgasms but those (laughs) parts of the body are to where mm-hmm. they could potentially affect each other. So right. And and sometimes um morning wood, for lack of a better reference, is is a physiological thing. It's not about that you wake up stimulated from an erotic thought or dream mm-hmm. or content. It's merely that the bladder is pushing on like the prostate, like, you know, there are things physically happening and it's kind of like um, and ergo, you know, the comedy of how, like, if you have a fully erect penis, you're trying to figure out how to pee, you know, do you yeah. stand on your head? Do you try to turn sideways, <laughs> you know, or do you just say, fuck it and go stand in the shower <laughs> and then, you know, take a shower afterwards and say that it'll lit or what? Um, I give yeah. myself, I usually am able to, for lack of a word, calm myself down. <laughs> To a point where I can direct <laughs> most of the time. 
Right. I mean, you there there's some flexibility uh, to that, but sometimes there really isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. So you know, you try to. I mean, to, you to gotta go. You gotta go. True. There's been many a times where it's been like, oh, I gotta like squat and sit and adjust and. <laughs> Like, right, so you find point. yourself doing odd things like sitting down on a toilet and then leaning over towards the floor just to yeah. be able to yeah. like just to like let's get that angle. Yeah. <laughs> and for me it was uh no, that's, I'm not gonna tell that story. Actually, let's go ahead and do it because it's this is all tea, whatever. Um it was really bad for me because in my old apartment, my bath like my bathroom floor was carpeted. The okay. worst thing in the world, honestly. So never, never again. But Crash. that meant like definitely focusing where the fuck you're going because you didn't have to clean that up <laughs> or else right. it gets to the carpet and it's gross. Uh, but yeah. It, being, a, being a child who grew up in a house with brown shag carpeting in their bathroom. God. Yes. Why? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Why? Um, Somebody somewhere made the decision. I don't know because that house is, is intergenerational in my family, and I'm not sure how, how, who, what, where, when that decision came about. Because mm-hmm. um, I don't think it was the people who built it in my family. But anyways, yes. Anyway, um, yeah. And one of the things that my aunt very first did when she moved in was share all that out. <laughs> she was yeah. like, she was like, uh, no. And I was like, yeah, I grew up with it. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Understandable. So, Ed, you've got some questions here, uh, and we might have more to discuss, I see. Um, one of them is, what are some common problems that men face during sex? So that was the, I mean, what that was basically um, as far as, like, some common sexual dysfunctions mm-hmm. that men could face. Like, uh, we kind of talked about the, uh, like, pre- uh, premature ejaculation is the most common um sexual dysfunction or sexual disorder that men men face in their lifetimes and the other one um is uh, erectile dysfunction um and and you know the the good thing about those are those are um dysfunctions that can be treatable um and uh which is a good thing right Mm -hmm. um through you know different exercises through different either medical um psychological uh interpersonal uh interventions and um, another one, we kind of talked about uh, retrograde ejaculation, um, specifically talking about ejaculation. So that is where when we ejaculate, the, the, uh, the semen goes into our bladder rather than out through our, our, um, out through our, our urethra or out through our penis. And if you can imagine, it's kind of painful, right? So like what's kind of happening there is the, that valve that Gary was talking about doesn't necessarily shut off. So um uh, so that can be a really painful one. And then um, there is also something um, where men could have pain during sex, not like um, uh, like my dissertation topic with antidyspernia, like uh, uh, pain during receptive anal intercourse, but they can have pain um, in their pelvic, uh, pelvic region, right, uh, mm-hmm. for different kinds of um, um, uro- urological uh, concerns. Um, so those are all things that would need to be, and that can like that can happen after like a a, pro, a prostatectomy, um, where where we where we remove the prostate, um, or you know different forms of cancer. Um, so these are all things that um, are issues that men can face. Uh, and then another one is um, delayed orgasm or delayed ejaculation. Um, and um, that is a that is a very typical issue that men face um, if they are taking some kind of um, uh, SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, right? Like uh, like Paxil, um, and uh, you know, like we said, that uh, ejaculation happens, you know, sometimes between our legs, but that's not always the, necessarily the case. Like we get messages from our brain, which triggers some of those responses. So some of the, the chemicals that are, that are released when we take an SSRI um, help, they kind of, um, uh, they inhibit um, the, uh, the ejaculatory response. So they don't kind of get us to that point. Um, hmm. That being said, um, people who have 
premature ejaculation are sometimes uh, prescribed an SSRI in order to delay their orgasm. Kind of a way to balance it out, as it were. Well, interesting. actually, and I have a clarified question. Does it delay the orgasm or does it delay the ejaculation? Delays the, I'm sorry, delays the ejaculation. Okay. Because it, it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't send the messages in order to trigger the ejaculatory response. Right. It doesn't, uh, to the veramen tatum. <laughs> veramen tatum. Um, so here's, here's my kind of question for you. And this is something that like in my past, I found a challenge when being intimate with another person is like, I have in my younger years been very focused on like the pleasure of my partner and created a, a flawed reward system psychologically that like, because they ejaculate, like I have been successful in my pleasuring of my partner. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's common? Like that, that most individuals, you know, make that connection that they think that ejaculate equals successful orgasm in terms of like their partner and, and, you know, what that means about the moment that they've shared? Absolutely. That's a product, right? That's something that we can see. Um, so like, we know that like we did good. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also like that's also the message that we send uh, that we receive when we're kind of growing up about sex, that um, that the the orgasm is is the definitive end of the experience. Um, and, you know, like we kind of just like we kind of talked about, sometimes um, orgasm and ejaculation isn't going to be on the table um, mm -hmm. for the other person. Sometimes it doesn't have to be. And in order for it to be a positive experience, and that can really um, uh, affect the other partner's uh, self-esteem, right? When um, if they don't get their partner to, to orgasm or to ejaculation, um, uh, you know, that can take a negative hit on the, the sexual, their sexual satisfaction and their sexual self-esteem. Um, and I would also say that this brings up the point, like we've talked about in the past about the, the baseball model of sex. Um, that we have a very linear, we have a very goal-oriented view of sex. And that's just all part of our sexual ex uh, expectations, right? And those can be changed, right? We can address those. And the cool thing is if we address it now, it's not going to be an issue later. Um, there are a lot of, uh, like, couples that I work with who are, um, you know, like, maybe, like, in their, their 50s or their 60s um, who are just now – uh, changing their um, uh, their idea about what sex can be, right? Um, and they're finding themselves having much more pleasurable and in the moment sex, right? Like I think that when we talk about the idea of um, uh, the ejaculation, right? We are very our partner focused when it comes to sex. And when we do that, we're not in our own body. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I really adopt the uh, the sensate focus approach um, to sex, which is uh, to focus on your own pleasure um, and like your own pleasure, like how it feels for you um, to receive pleasure from your partner and how it feels for you to to give pleasure to your partner, like in your own body, right? And mm -hmm. not not um, externalizing your pleasure and placing it on your partner. Because I don't know about you, like, I have definitely um, been with uh, some men, and we've had that conversation, right? Like, um, you know, and they've been very upfront, like, they're like, I'm probably not going to orgasm. I'm probably not going to ejaculate. Um, and uh, and that's okay, right? Um, mm -hmm. I've had this issue, right? Um, and I said, okay, well, is there anything that you want me to focus on? Um, is there, you know, what do you really like about the sexual experience? Um and um, and that has really made that has really uh, addressed my own anxiety, right? Because that is a that is something that I have also experienced. Where if my partner, if I'm not able to to get my partner to an orgasm, I feel like I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I have really valued those conversations um, about like you know uh, like what what do you want out of this. Mm -hmm experience yeah. um I, i've met many a person who 
we've talked about it before where their goal is to get you off and it's good in some ways and not so good in others because one you never you, you don't know like sometimes you don't know like yes we've talked about like there's that point where you're gonna ejaculate like when you get to that point but if you don't ever get to that point or get anywhere near that point then it's probably not going to happen you're not going to ejaculate and sometimes that can happen for reasons beyond your that you're not aware of you know it just may not be a good experience it may not be you may have too much on your in your head you may be too much in your mind you may be you may not be physically able to just for one reason or another and it can be difficult i think to have someone whose goal is to get derive ple- they derive pleasure from your pleasure if that makes sense mm-hmm. or your ejaculation and if you can't do that it's kind of that other feeling too like the person may feel bad because they weren't able to have you achieve that goal and you feel bad because you can't achieve that goal yeah but a good talk conversation would be definitely interesting i've had um i've I've played with people who have explained that their they don't their intention in this moment in this um partnership i should say um they want to experience me and they want to experience essentially if they can get me off most of the time i'm usually down for it because i can usually get off okay Uh, there have been moments where i haven't been able to and i've had to explain to them like you can try (laughs) <laughs> like I don't know if it's going to happen but you can definitely try and um, I've enjoyed those moments too because it's allowed for exploration um, trying to think of different ways or come up like touching and physical you know and, and mental things to kind of do things that may not be the norm to kind of come up with ways to achieve that orgasm or that ejaculation and learning things about yourself and learning things about the other person that you didn't know before it's very interesting very intriguing i think the other thing like uh so damon that you were talking about like sometimes we could be something could be going on with us right like Mm -hmm. the one thing that i will tell people is that anxiety is poison in the bedroom Mm mm-hmm um so uh you know that's really that's really important it's really really important for you for us to be relaxed right Mm -hmm. Uh, to create a uh a really um comfortable uh environment um for the sexual experience to uh to happen yeah one of the things i'm not the biggest fan of is expectations yeah there's um uh there is a really good book called sexual awareness um and uh the coping with um premature ejaculation and uh um erectile dysfunction books that i that i i use often in my work um talk heavily about uh addressing sexual expectations um Mm -hmm. so the other thing uh you know on the topic of uh, ejaculation and possibly some difficulties is if we're having a hard time with stimulation of the of the the penis it may be important since we know that ejaculation uh stems from the uh from the prostate gland right um doing some like base of the penis um and like uh uh grundle (laughs) right (laughs) stimulation of the grundle right um because that can um you know possibly uh stimulate that verimentatum right um which could in 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 receiving those it could you know trigger the um the ejaculatory um process mm. so i'm definitely a big fan of uh prostate uh, prostate massages mm-hmm. i know many a friend that enjoys that more than actually jerking like sucking like they enjoy like 
putting something like either there, like on the taint, haha, or up the butt to like um, vibrate and stimulate that area, as opposed to like actually stimulating the penis. And what's really interesting is if you um, uh, if you are a heavy precomer, um, if you stimulate the prostate gland, um, you will that it's almost like. When you stimulate it, you'll automatically see some uh, some uh, presence of some precon. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> For those of you that didn't make see note. what just happened, David was making notes. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, I, I did, before we wrap up, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, in the pre-show. I was explaining well it wasn't even i don't think we were on air yet one of the things that i think people get um tied up in is how orgasm they they presume an orgasm is an ejaculation which we've talked about that it isn't and that they um take and put like uh psychological aspects to things that happen in in the moment, you know, and if they're like we kind of talked about, if there isn't an ejaculate, what that means? Is the partner pleasured? Do we take them at their word? Um, you know, and and I think because everybody's orgasm can be different, that's be, becomes a challenge to interpret. Because I think the if there's an ejaculation, it's a much simpler like yes no presumption on the part of the other partner like oh they ejaculated therefore they must be satisfied do you know what i mean like and how I do. like that's really incorrect <laughs> <laughs> yeah so just because they um yeah just because there's there's an eject i mean we kind of talked about this with the bridgerton stuff right just because right. there's an ejaculation doesn't mean that it was uh necessarily good time <laughs> mm -hmm. right um and like so when we're talking about like the orgasm right that's the subjective experience of the sex that's all the uh the sexual tension that is being released um uh that has been building up since since we kind of started this um and uh and so gary like one of the things that you talked about um in the pre-show that i i think is really valuable is the idea that we don't kind of talk about the uh subjective experience of pleasure um growing up and i have a really funny story about that so um when i was growing up um i my parents didn't talk to me about sex um i have a really interesting experience of going to my pediatrician i don't remember how old i was but my pediatrician saying um don't touch yourself that's not good um and like not really even knowing what he was talking about but i automatically felt, felt this sense of shame um so i always associated like hey i shouldn't be doing that um i didn't know what masturbation was until i was in the eighth grade i didn't know what the word was or i didn't i had no concept of what that was um mm. and uh i thought that um sex right when people talked about it was just um the pre-cum um so when i would you know play with myself or pleasure well, what i thought was pleasuring myself when i would get the um the pre-cum i thought that it was done mm. so it wasn't until i was in college <laughs> um that somebody uh, uh, you know, it, it was like first weekend of college and somebody was talking about, uh, sex. And I was like, I was at a group of like, maybe like 12 people. And I said, I don't see what the big deal is. It doesn't really, it doesn't really feel anything. Like, I don't, I don't really get it. And like, it got really quiet. <laughs> and somebody turned to me and said, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I mean, like, just some, like, clear stuff comes out. Like, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really feel um, any, and, like, and they said, no, no, you have to keep going. And somebody 
taught me about, you know, somebody had to like literally teach me and they were like, when it feels like you have to pee, you're on the right track. Um, and they were like, keep going. And I, I ran, I like, I was at college. So I drove my ass all the way home that weekend, ran right upstairs and had my first orgasm and ejaculation. And I was like, what oh my the- God. <laughs> yeah, like, Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and this was, I, I, I like to say that this is all because nobody talked to me about this. Nobody told me that it was supposed to feel good. And, oh my gosh, like, think about all of the stuff that I was missing. Uh, yeah. All that time so, you just pre k when you could have kept going. I could have kept going. Oh. Oh. <sighs> I interesting. Love that That's an interesting story. I am. Huh. See, this is why people need to talk about sex. The, the, this prudish nature of the United States. You need to get over your prudish nature and actually talk about it. Fair. Well, that that's is... part of. That's part of what I was saying before I think we went live or after we went live was, you know, like our, our nation is really messy when it comes to the concept of like sex and sex ed and like because it seems like all of it or the majority of it is just focused on procreation. But the reality is that is one aspect of sex, like sex can be intimate. It can be, you know, um, it can have a full range of emotions. And how do we handle that? How do we process and how do we deal with that? But our education system is built off of like, what do we create as a baseline? What is, what is the standard of acceptable, like, you know, ex, you know, facts and so on and so forth. And, you know, measurement to get us to test and, you know, okay. it, and, and then it just kind of gets dropped and it, get, and it stays at that point. I mean, this isn't the same thing, but it reminds me of how, like, you know, when I went to school, we had, shop class and home economics. I had to learn to cook. I had to learn to sew. I had to learn like, you know, these quote unquote home economic skills. I also had to go to shop class. I had to learn metalwork and woodwork and, you know, and do these things because the concept was it made you a more well-rounded individual to have some exposure to trades and concepts and understanding, you know, basics of these things. Um, in math class, we balanced a checkbook. Some people didn't even know what the hell a checkbook was or a checking account, but you know, these were these were things that were done. But I know that that's changed also over the decades, mm -hmm. and some of that really isn't um, covered or considered anymore. And I think that our education about the physiological and beyond of intimacy and procreation and sex and all that, you know, is is part of where this becomes an issue that folks do not know how to communicate. They don't understand, you know, what the aspects are. And I'm part of that. Like I'm, I admit yeah. very much that I'm a flawed individual because of my upbringing and my experiences. Um, one thing I keep coming back to is I don't recall, I think it's been less than a handful of times out of the experiences that I've had. And I'm not saying I'm a whore, but I will admit like I've had some practice in my life. Um, <laughs> you know, of, of having sex with people, but it's less than a handful of times that I actually feel like there was a consensual discussion or agreement in the moment. And that's very problematic because yeah. we don't discuss consent like as a part of like negotiation or discussion okay. of being with another person. I think there's a huge amount of like presumption that you and I are in this space. We're together. This is obviously the focus of what we're doing. Ergo, we both want to do what needs to be done. But like, there's no discussion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's no actual communication. There's no agreement. And, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's a satisfactory experience for both people. It mm -hmm. might be for one, but not necessarily for the other. You seem yeah. intrigued or puzzled then. No, um, it's making me think about when I was on, when I was taking SSRIs, um, some antidepressants, um, like a, about a year ago, you like a year or two ago, I had to tell people like, hey, listen, I may not, I may not come. 
and that's okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just here first, you know, uh, there are other things that I am more focused on, um, mm -hmm. right now. I don't, I don't necessarily need that. I'm here for your pleasure. Um, if you, if you, uh, want that, right. But I may, I may not have that. So if that doesn't happen, uh, please don't get offended or please don't, th please don't take that personally. Mm -hmm. Right. My, my mm -hmm. body's just having a hard time processing ejaculation. Right. It's fair. And it's a good way to, I think it's a, it's, I think though, that's the, what I think Gary, what I'm getting at is having those conversations, being honest and understanding of yourself and your body and having that like dialogue with someone because of how many of us were raised or how the, you know, educated on sex those kind of conversations don't happen. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things don't don't get addressed. We've awake. I will admit, like recent years, especially, has awakened a lot of those. Like we're having these conversations, we're talking about these things, especially now because we've learned through the years that we can't not have these conversations. But now that we're having them, it's becoming a new learning process for everyone you know you can't expect someone to know what's going on in your head and therefore in order to address what's going on in your head you need to kind of talk about it you need to say something about it you know you ed when you're talking about like i, I was taking these, these medications that were making it difficult for me to ejaculate i'm not going to know that unless you tell me mm -hmm. you know like and so if you didn't say anything about it and we just kind of kept going at it and I was working my hardest to get you to do something that you know you're probably not going to be able to do, then that's going to be frustrating, distressing, whatever to me. Um, and you're going to probably feel a certain kind of way because someone is trying, but they're not doing it. But we haven't had that conversation to kind of address it beforehand. Right. So it's the, the you know, having conversations about sex. And I will admit, like, one of the good things about this, this particular genre that we do has been rewarding in that sense, in that I'm hoping people are listening to these and understanding, like, you need to have these conversations. You need to have these dialogues. You need to maybe get a little uncomfortable in your, like, norm to address what you might need or what you can't can and can't do you know this topic is a big example of things that we probably have never considered you know are are just now considering after years of having moments where you were hard as a rock and you were going at it and and but nothing was happening you were not exactly, you were not reaching where other, you had to figure out why. This is why. Mm -hmm. It's a totally separate physical response. <laughs> yeah. Bless you. You can get it right, Jeff. <laughs> um, I was waiting to, uh, I, I muted both Skype and <laughs> the stream. The sneeze. We oh, just fuck. heard that. <laughs> Like we, yeah. we kind of heard the we kind of heard the intake, and everybody like kind of looked because we were like, "What the heck?" Um, no, I mean, I, I and I think the a commonality that's really unfortunate is that we have presumed expectations. Mm -hmm. I think MSM are probably really um, at the forefront of this presumed expectation thing that we just don't communicate. You know, we're just like, you know, I I think. And this, I don't like saying it this way. The only thing that comes to mind is like, I'm a man, you're a man. We do these things that men do. Like, you know, so, you know, and and, and there is this whole flawed concept behind that, that, you know, yeah. both are going to have an erection. Both are going to ejaculate. You know what I mean? And and, and I'm like, mm, yeah, yeah, if you're not really having any discussions about that. And, and don't get me wrong. There are times and places where things make sense that you're gonna presume some stuff like if you're in a public place and let's say you know in a restroom and there's a glory hole 
and a dick comes through it that's erect. I think, you know, the expectation there is it's kind of safe to presume. Um, it's meant to be anonymous. It's meant to be short. It's, you know, it's meant to be very task oriented. And I'll mm -hmm. say it. Um, yes. I wouldn't necessarily consider a glory hole an intimate moment. Um, it can be, but I don't think that that's kind of the, the concept. And, you know, I, I think that there's a, a whole variety of like, you know, notions, moments and and things. Um, but, you know, if you're going to if if you're going to initiate with another person to, you know, have some level of intimacy to basically to have sex with them, you know, having a discussion, having a conversation, setting expectations, I think is, you know, far more um, eventful and has a better outcome. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't taught. No. Negotiation, like, you know, none of that is a discussion. And I'm part of the generation that we didn't really have sex education. Mm. Like, in right. elementary school, fifth or sixth grade, the girls got to go to a special thing and the guys got to go outside for recess. <laughs> that was it. Like, oh, the God. guys didn't even get their own thing. Like, that oh, came along God. later. So, you know, all the girls got to watch the movie, quote unquote, that talked about menstruation. And apparently they got like a little like kit or whatever that I guess apparently gave them like their first tampon or a maxi pad or I don't even know because like I was young and it wasn't discussed. And, mm -hmm. you know, the boys were kind of considered dumb little boys, um, you know, and I say it that way because they were just, oh, just go, you know, do recess or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So the mm -hmm. girls are gone for a couple of hours. The guys have no idea what's going on. And then it's not even discussed. Like, yep. and sex isn't Got really me. discussed or broken down. And even when it was, it was just, you know, like, you know, a man and a woman and they create a baby. Circle of life. Yeah. yeah. I remember um, the, as far back, I want to say as far back as like fifth grade, we did what was called family life. And it was a program and it was essentially the sex ed program. You had to get consent from your parents to do it. Da 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 da. And we did that in fifth grade. And then when we went to middle school, it was called something else. But it was all very scientific procreation clinical. Based. Great. Yeah. yeah. What did you say, Jeff? Clinical. Clinical. Oh, yeah. clinical. I thought you said yeah. cult, and I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> I was like that's a little. How do you get cult from clinical? It, it the, the 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 microphone didn't catch all of it. It was it was a very short ish kind of word. Oh, okay. We did, yeah, we didn't get all the syllables. We got cool. I didn't enunciate <laughs> my pronunciation. Well, I think it was more of a technical issue. I don't know if it was bandwidth or or yeah, drop or whatever for a brief second. I was like, "What?" Yeah, it, it, but I I recall those those having those um, classes parentheses um, because that was what that was the only way we learned about things and and it was it was for boys and girls it was both sides um, it was there were only certain points in time that we were separate. But for the most part, it was all at the same time. Um, but it was again very, you know, clinical and very just like procreation and and scientific. I'll use that word. That's the word that kind of comes to mind. Right. It was all about the science of of, science. of what's going on, of puberty and sex and and whatever. It did not talk about the emotions. The 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 um yeah the emotions the mental aspects of what sex can be and i feel that that is again part of like we've been talking about part of the conversation that needs to happen you know same as like conversation about financial obligations and stuff like that things like that there are things that as a child you need to learn so that when you become an adult you're not trying to learn them because most people will think you already know, but you don't know because you were never taught. I, I mean, one of the things is like, I, I think part of this is, is 
the psycho psychology of the whole matter. And mm-hmm. it, when is the first time that it comes to you available to you in our schooling system of having some sort of psych class, any sort of psych class? Mm. Um, it's not until like high school. I don't, I, I don't think I even had any in middle school. Well, it was junior high when it was there and mm-hmm. long school system yeah, 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 changes. Yeah. Uh, but the first eight years of schooling, nine if you include kindergarten, um, it, there's a lot of it is just data, information, you know, clinical stuff. Um, it, it doesn't really go into the psychology about emotions and empathy and, and such like that, which honestly, the beginnings of should be given much closer to much younger child, child, because they're just, I don't know about you, but kids are mean. <laughs> Okay, Jeff. I mean, it, it, there's like, it, it, and I, I mean, like, it, 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 elementary school and 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 and, and middle school, just kids could be just mean to each other. Uh, I mean, they're not in the ways that some of the the uh, the elders, uh, like once you get into high school, would be, but, um, every. Having the kind of beginnings of like um, understanding emotions and feelings and 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 the psychology of things, just even just the basics, um, uh, being more introduced in, it, in the beginning would be uh, very helpful. And then as we get on, once we start getting into the psychology. One of the things could be the psychology of sex. You know, being uh, of interpersonal relationships. I mean, it, mm. it really isn't talked much about, at least that I remember in any of my schooling, of how to how to uh, 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 empathize, sympathize uh, with other people and try to get on their level for one thing for all those people who are in customer service empathy is a really big thing (laughs) understanding those emotions i think there's i think there are some uh programs that are that have been coming out recently um to help with that right because uh because jeff i think like what you're kind of talking about is the fact that like there are a lot of stuff that is out of our control emotions are one of them and why are we not teaching children what to do with these uncontrollable things that are happening in their body? Um, like even like with desire, right? Um, with attraction, um, things like that. Like, you know, these are things that we don't necessarily have control over. And when we try to exert control over them, this is where kids get mean. Um, this is where kids, you know, where they, they act out. Um, so I think it is really important that we, Focus on that, and there's there's a uh, I'm I don't remember the name, but there is a program called Whole Person or Whole Self, um, which is kind of like a sex education program that is out of the um, it's out of like a religious organization or a spiritual organization. Uh, sexual. <laughs> Time for Google to be our friend. Or dot com or, or, or Bing or whatever whatever your 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 preferred search engine is. Uh, our whole lives. Ah. It's a um, a six comprehensive uh, sexuality curricula for children, teenagers, young adults, and adults, um, uh, published by the Universalist Association and the United Church of Christ, Justice, and Witness Ministries. Hmm. Um, It teaches about heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, and transgender sexual health. Um, 
it helps children, youth, and adults to be emotionally healthy and responsible in terms of their sexuality. Interesting. Nice. You got it. Hmm. Um, there you go. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued that it's got some faith aspect, like backing creation, whichever. I'm owning that I'm reluctant when mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. things get involved. Um, Fair. Well, the UCC um, is a very progressive faith organization. That's true. That's like, true. Very, <laughs> very progressive. Well, that's and that's good. the that's the part where I'm struggling a little bit because I'm like I'm not familiar with them, so to just hear of them like as a church, yeah. so to speak, or whatever, I'm like, oh, like my little like uh, spidey sense, like gets gets activated. I'm kind of like, oh. Okay. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, it's fair. It happens. Trust me. It's it's it's. Yeah, it's. It did me too when he said it, and I was like, "Oh, but he said Mary's church first. And sorry, that's where my head went. It went. You, I heard heard the church thing, and I was like, "Oh, oh, 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 oh." And I was like, Wait. "Red flag, red flag." Yeah, but then you, when you mentioned who it was, there's, I, it dimmed a little. So. We'll see. I'm not. I'm not knocking it. I'd. I'd like to look into it a little more, and see what all what it's all about. You know, but it could be something worth doing. Mm-hmm. You, you know that phrase, uh, "one bad egg spoils a bunch" or whatever it is. Something like that. Yeah. Um. A that that's basically what the 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 uh, majority <sighs> of uh, faith systems are right now. <laughs> It is, or, or the the major ones, is uh, because faith. Well, I may not necessarily have a spiritual faith per se. Um, it, faith is important to a lot of people, and there's a lot of really good people who are uh, uh, faith based. Per, mm. That's the right word, right term for it, but. Um, so just because somebody says something is based on a faith or, or something shouldn't mean that red flag immediately being like, Oh, who are they? What are they about? If you're not familiar with them, especially. So it's it's the big thing to to look for. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and, and I think it's fair to say, you know, that we have a tendency as I think as a species to be on the lookout for danger. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think we're 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 wired to look to the negative as opposed to the positive or or to make presumptions out of like self preservation. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, and it just takes some, you know, some recalibrating, some balancing to be like, okay. Not every not every person of spiritual faith is you know is out to get you or to you know uh, corrupt you or change you or whatever um, you know the the concern may be or the reluctance. So yeah, I think there's definitely some some things to be considered when it comes to that. But any other questions for Ed, mm-hmm. gentlemen? Mm-hmm. 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 I think this. This went in a, a really great direction. I'm really glad that we did this. Mm-hmm. And the, the the big thing uh, for people to learn is you can be pleasurable, have an orgasm, but not necessarily ejaculate. Or you ejaculate, but don't necessarily have an orgasm. Either one isn't necessarily the goal. The goal should probably just be pleasure. Because I have plenty Absolutely. of times where I've had sex and I just couldn't orgasm but i enjoyed the experience anyway well and i think like sex in and of itself is about connection like if it's with another individual that's that's the aspect of what's happening is that you're connecting with another person and i don't mean like i don't know how else to say that i was about to say like duplo blocks or legos but I was like <laughs> that's not exactly right um 
yeah, there's kind of that like some people presume there's an insertion aspect that's not a always the case. B. Yeah. Yeah. Um and and that's another thing, you know, that uh I'm hoping folks have as a takeaway is like intimacy has, you know, all sorts of different variables to it. And I, you know, we've talked about it before and we touched it on it again, I think in this episode, you know, communication is kind of key, you know, have a, have a discussion, have a, you know, a, a sharing of ideals or expectations, and then you can, you know, see how much more enjoyable that um, experience can be with the other persons. Yeah. I'll leave it that way. I think that's, that's a good place to end. Because there's plenty mm-hmm. of ways to contact us. Uh, tell us about your orgasms and ejaculations by commenting on our blog at comesonline.com. Shoot us an email at comesonline at gmail.com or ejaculate your orgasm into our phone line. Oh uh, my god. 612 <laughs> That was better in my head. <laughs> I'm sure it did. <laughs> <laughs> you can also pop over to our social media uh, outlets at uh, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube at comes out on the appropriate place in the URL. Uh, you can join our entourage chat at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. Uh, find out when we're planning on recording these shows by going to tinyurl.com slash calendar dash col. Uh, you can get various uh, merchandise accoutrements, such as a uh, Cubs Out Loud version 1 shirt, a now that you're sticky, here's your cookie shirt that Gary's wearing, Hello, the most appropriate shirt for today, I thought. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and somebody didn't try to communicate shirt, but... to try and coordinate. Or, That's like okay. Ed is wearing uh, a version 3 shirt, which, don't forget, you can always customize it with, like, putting your name in the back or something. <laughs> See? We got official COL sex therapist right on the back there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all over at Zazzle.com slash comes out loud. Again, you can go to your appropriate country localization if you are not in the U.S. Um, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash comes out loud or just send them some cash by going to ppel.me slash comes out loud. Uh, you can rate us and uh, subscribe to us through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, uh, Amazon and Audible. You can find me anywhere in the internet. It's box up, box puppy, box called box something or other or over on Twitch where you can find me playing games. I played Stardew Valley this past week, which was really fun, and then got me back into playing Stardew Valley again, um, as well as WoW and some B&D at Windgem, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M, on Twitch. Demon. Okay. Which you can touch with me, you can find me um, as TheaterCup79 on most bear-related sites are on Facebook. Or you can find me as Pup underscore Umbra on Twitter, but Twitter is definitely not safe for work. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GearBear73. Ed, if they would like to get in touch with you for discussion on this topic or other items of interest, how would they find you? Sure. So you can find me on Facebook at Edward AC. Um, you can uh, also uh, find me on um, uh, oh gosh, where am I? You can find me on uh, you can actually find me on uh, uh, where am I? Where oh, am I? You can find me on TikTok uh, <laughs> most recently at uh, Unicub79. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Eddie H. Cook. Um, and I also have an uh, not safe for work, but, um, you know, just message me for those details if you want to mm. get on there. Or you can email me at AngelineCook at gmail.com. And uh, with that, say good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Have a good one, y'all. Ciao for now.